an outline of my comments this evening is I'd like to um, briefly discuss my background and what perspectives I offer to our topic tonight, and then briefly define bioinformatics and biotechnology before discussing some different paths that one can take into these different fields. And finally end with comments about some emerging technologies and opportunities for growth. And so um, I, I did my undergraduate work at Haverford, came to Hopkins, as, as you mentioned in the introduction, and all the way through as an academic, I've had the chance to have contacts with industry. For example, my graduate school work was funded by the world's biggest perfume company as I was studying the sense of smell. And um, similarly, at Stanford, where the atmosphere is really a lot more entrepreneurial than here in Maryland, um, at least in my experience, um, I've always had a chance to have contact with companies, and that's continued now. Whereas an academic, we work with both biotech and pharmaceutical companies, where our goals are often the same. And one theme for tonight is how important it is to network and meet people in these different areas, which you can do through events like the one tonight to try to learn more about the opportunities that are available there. Um, my research has been on childhood brain disorders, but I also bring the perspective tonight of being a teacher in the field of bioinformatics. The first time that I taught at Hopkins in the med school was about 10 years ago, and 300 people showed up to the first class. It was just um, overwhelming because people wanted to know what bioinformatics is. They came from all different departments and disciplines, and what they share in common is a need to go to the computer to solve some problem. And they wanted to know what this new emerging discipline had to offer. Now, 10 years later, I think that the field of bioinformatics has flourished and matured, and that in a sense, its place is to serve biology and help answer questions <coughs> about how to do things. And so along the way, I wrote a textbook on, on bioinformatics, which I'd like to introduce to you by saying what its three parts are. The first part is basic bioinformatics. How do you go to the computer to pull out information about sequences, align them to each other, search a database. Um, when you do a multiple sequence alignment, you can visualize that as a phylogenetic tree. These are some basic operations that one does in bioinformatics. The next part goes on to more functional studies, functional genomics. And I didn't want to stop there because I thought, once you have the tools of bioinformatics, what do you do with them? My interest is in human disease, but also what we do in the last third of the book is take a tour of the tree of life. Viruses, bacteria, and archaea, onto the eukaryotes, from parasites onto primates, and finally end with the human genome. I don't think that you can really study the human genome without the tools of bioinformatics. And um, so they're integrally related. And likewise, I don't want to stop with bioinformatics. I don't think that we're here to build the best database for its own sake or better computer algorithms for their own sake. And so this serves as a segue into a definition of what bioinformatics and biotechnology are, at least to me. Um, the goals of, in teaching it are to provide introduction to um, the major centers of bioinformatics, such as NCBI, the National Center for Biotechnology Information, to focus on molecules, DNA, RNA, and proteins, to analyze genomes, and then to help students both merge their theory and practice to solve problems. And so for definitions, um, a simple definition of bioinformatics is that it's the interface of biology or molecular biology and computer science and slightly more formally, the analysis of proteins, genes, and genomes using computer algorithms and databases, where genomics, the analysis of genomes, uses the tools of bioinformatics to make sense of billions and now trillions of base pairs of DNA sequence that have been obtained. Biotechnology is really an applied science in which, just as technology is the application of science, um, its relevant areas include biomedicine for most of us here, but also agriculture in an important way. And here visually is a way that I like to think about this discipline. Um, at the top, we have a big circle with tool users, and these are people who would go to the computer to solve some problem. At the bottom, we have tool makers who might be computer programmers or those who are trying to create more of an infrastructure. I place bioinformatics as one circle and see it overlapping with medical informatics, another flourishing field where people do things such as um, create electronic health records, or try to systematize information about patients. Um, and then public health informatics, nursing informatics. There are many different sub-disciplines of informatics that are now flourishing as their own fields. At the bottom, we have the tool makers, including those who create databases or algorithms or IT infrastructure. And so these people somehow have to communicate with each other. And in my view, what really separates the people in bioinformatics from everyone else for the most part just to generalize, 
is a pretty big dividing line that people in bioinformatics have some knowledge of DNA and they care about DNA and genes in a way that others often don't. And so I see there, there being different cultures here and often um, this to me is a big dividing line in how that works. At the molecular level, we can think about bioinformatics and biotechnology as ranging from the small to the medium to the large size. At the small size, we have the cell shown in this cartoon with DNA transcribed to RNA and translated to protein, somehow defining the phenotype of a cell and onward to the phenotype of an organism. We can move on to the body where bioinformatics and in a sense biotechnology also are fundamentally about comparisons. What happens in this organism over different times of development? What happens in different parts of the body? Or if you have cells in a dish from a patient versus control cells or cells plus and minus virus treatment. There are different kinds of questions that we address in, in biotechnology. And then at the largest scale, we have the whole tree of life. And we'll hear from our next speaker tonight, I believe, about um, marine biotechnology, about um, you know, issues relevant to this. But I think that the scope and domain of bioinformatics includes the study of all organisms. And you can only make a tree like this by having molecular sequence data that, that encompass all these different organisms. There was a really beautiful figure that the National Center for Biotechnology Information it used to include on its website showing a spectacular increase in the amount of DNA that had been sequenced. And so we went over through the 1980s, um, through the 80s, through the, to this tremendous growth period up through 2002 when we reached some 30 billion base pairs of DNA that had been sequenced. And this was really a kind of giddy time. Um, I had the opportunity to, to patent several genes. Um, in, in other words, I had the opportunity to discover genes and then try to define new functions for them and uses for them. And at this time, uh, the sense was that this was a tremendous growth curve. By 2008, this same kind of curve went up to 200 billion base pairs. And so that's shown up here at the top. And 200 billion base pairs was worth some sort of celebration and we can call that 0.2 terabases. And this was November two years ago. Today, we have 71 terabases in the main repository. This is a spectacular increase in the amount of sequence data. And to me, this alone best described the dramatic explosion of information in the field of bioinformatics and uh, highlights the opportunities in biotechnology. Why is so much DNA being sequenced? Because there's been, there have been technological breakthroughs that let us do it. And these can be applied to understanding the human genome and the genomes of other organisms. And these are opening up oppor opportunities to see more deeply into very fundamental biological principles and to address questions that have been asked decades ago or longer. Um, one example of this, you may know that if you have a favorite gene, you might try to study its function by knocking it out in yeast, if there's a yeast homologue, or you could get a mouse knockout. We can now start thinking about the day in the near future when we have several hundred thousand human genomes sequenced and we can find a couple dozen humans who have a gene knocked out and have a human knockout collection. There are different paradigms. There's a real shift in the way we can think about opportunities to study gene function that are just emerging. In terms of academic and industry paths to um, biotechnology and different career opportunities, my perspective is as an academic and in my classes, I typically have large classes and I talk to students about where they want to go. And I um, can tell you what I'm looking for when I try to guide them and what advice I can try to give. A core sort of traditional conservative in a sense academic path would be to take an undergrad degree, perhaps get a master's degree, enter a PhD program, do a postdoctoral fellowship and perhaps go for an academic faculty position. And from there, many doors are open as to what happens next. But there are many, many different options in my case, um, I was asked to leave my undergraduate institution because I failed my science classes and they told me to go somewhere else. And so I did that. I came from where, from Haverford down to Johns Hopkins. And um, that was really great to come down here, but I struggled at every step. When I went to graduate school, I essentially um, failed out of graduate school and went to a company and they said to me, we'll give you a job, but we think you should stick it out and find a way to get a PhD. And so I'm someone who struggled as a student at every step. and. Um, aware of what it's like to have a particular path blocked and to have the feeling that I don't know how I'm going to get to the next stage that I want to get to. Um, and yet there are ways to do that and to keep uh, finding, defining what your vision is and finding ways to reach what your goals are. 
as it happens at each of the different steps here, there are a world of opportunities and different paths you can follow. As one example, I'm familiar with a number of um, both um, opportunities with large pharmas for people to do postdocs out of academia or to do positions or spend time working in a company and it's easier now than it was in the past, say 10 or 20 years ago, to move back and forth between the world of biotech and um, pharmaceuticals, which are larger, and then academics and also government. And there are a number of students at Johns Hopkins, for example, who are spending time at NCBI, learning invaluable skills and getting contacts that can help them to find where they want to go. I'd like to conclude with just a couple comments about um, emerging opportunities. One thing is, as you as a candidate, as you're looking to uh, find a place, can make yourself more attractive if you're multidisciplinary. You can say, in the realm of biology, can you define what a gene is? And I know a number of people who are very skilled at programming who don't fundamentally know what a gene is. Others know basic biostats and can explain what a p-value is, while many others can't. Yet another domain is programming. Some people know R and Perl and Python and other languages. And if you're a biologist and you don't know how to open up a big spreadsheet that has a few million rows, you're really going to be limited and you're not going to be able to analyze big data sets, whether you're working in the area of microarrays or whatever else. I think you have an opportunity to define your own personal program of what you want to learn and try to be as versatile as you can. In terms of growth areas, my personal experience is one example that I mentioned is next generation sequencing, which is undergoing explosive growth and it takes people with real motivation and real interest and a real broad set of skills and perhaps most importantly, curiosity and a willingness to learn and professionalism, putting all those things together. Um, microarrays in many forms continue to exhibit uh, growth, allowing us to address basic biological questions and applied questions about disease. And finally, as we understand more and more about the genetic basis of disease, we can turn towards the problem of therapies and what kind of um, what kind of opportunities there are to find treatments. And we see this most clearly at the Kennedy Krieger Institute where there are 13,000 patients who come in each year and for most of them, we don't know what's wrong. For most of them, we have no drugs to offer. We can't cure intellectual disability, learning or language disorders. And uh, what happens in each of these cases can, can often be tragic and our motivation couldn't be stronger to try to use the tools of biotechnology to make progress in these areas. I'd like to um, stop with that and thank you for your attention and look forward to any questions you might have in the period coming up. Thank you, Jonathan.